So today I want to talk about fresh starts. I could guess technically we could say we get one of those every day. I don't know if many of you remember that poster. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. I'm pretty sure I had that in my room as a teenager on the wall. But today I'm speaking specifically about where we are in the calendar year and also our scripture today, which comes from the Gospel of Mark. So from a calendar perspective, we're rounding out the first full week of a brand new year. And I don't know about you, but I've heard many comments this week in the media and in casual conversation about how many of us are anxious to put 2017 behind us. There's this feeling of newness, of promise, that comes with the start of a new year. The ending of a year feels like a good time to reflect, to decide to leave some things behind, and look to the future with the hope that it will be different. We're energized to make the most of this opportunity of a new year, a fresh start. Maybe to recommit to some goals that we haven't quite reached yet in the past year. Or maybe even try something new this year. And from a liturgical perspective, or from a church calendar perspective, we're also starting in a new place. We're starting to focus on a new gospel, the book of Mark. And some of you may recall, our new church year actually began with Advent at the beginning of last month. And at Pilgrim, we follow the Revised Common Lectionary, which is designed to lead us through the key scriptures in a three-year cycle. So each year in the cycle has a different emphasis in the Gospel, and we are now in year B. And so the focused Gospel is Mark. So as much as it makes sense, we'll be exploring Mark together in worship this year. And I say as much as it makes sense, because one of the really interesting things about the Gospel of Mark is that the writer begins telling the story of Jesus with his baptism, not with his birth. So we didn't read from Mark during Advent because we were talking about the story of Jesus' birth, and that story is not covered in the Gospel of Mark. Now another unique characteristic of the Gospel of Mark, and I'm sure we'll revisit this, over the course of the year, is that the story of Jesus is told in a very urgent and almost impatient manner. Things just happen really, really quick. It's one of my favorite Gospels. <laughs> it's like an action-packed novel. In its original form, it has a pretty dramatic and mysterious ending that leaves more questions than answers. But we'll get to that in due time. Today, we're at the beginning of Mark and at the telling of the story of Jesus. So in the book of Mark, the story of Jesus Christ begins when Jesus is ready to stop living his normal life as the son of a carpenter. He leaves his friends and family behind and he's starting his career in public ministry. He's discerned that it's time for him to make this fresh start, time to move out of the family home, to accept the call to the role that he was born to play. Now, as Maureen mentioned, John, Jesus begins this new phase of his life by seeking out his cousin John and joining the renewal movement that John's been leading for several years. So a little bit about John. He was a classic Hebrew prophet who had been saying some very frank and troublesome things to those who were rich and powerful, and some very hopeful things to the poor and marginalized. He'd been speaking truth to power and in the end, as with most prophets, that gets him into trouble. As John was spreading his message, he called on people to repent or think differently, to change their minds to a new way of thinking, to see the world with fresh eyes. And then he baptized them in the river as a sign of their repentance, a reminder of their commitment to change that would create a better world for everyone and a symbol of their initiation into a community committed to the same goals. So when Jesus was ready to begin his public ministry, the work that he was born to do, he goes to John to be baptized. And as Maureen mentioned, John had baptized many, many, many people, hence his name, John the Baptist. John knows, though, that Jesus has no need to repent or think differently. 
He already embodies everything that John is preaching and more. And that's why he initially declines. But Jesus insists, and when Jesus is baptized, he and God have a very special moment. According to the story, the heavens are ripped open, and God says directly to Jesus, in a voice that only Jesus can hear, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. What a wonderful affirmation, especially when you're about to start something new. The start of something new, whether it's a new job, a new relationship, a new year, it has a certain energy and excitement of the unknown, but that often comes with at least a hint of anxiety about the uncertainty of the unknown. We're motivated by all the possibilities to grow, to learn, accomplish, and achieve, but we might also be a little intimidated by the challenge of the change, the risk of doing something new. What if I'm not as good at this new thing as I had hoped I would be? What if other people, people I care about, what if they don't like the change that I'm trying to make? What if it doesn't turn out the way that I'm expecting or hoping that it now Jesus was lucky, because just as he was about to embark on the greatest challenge of his life, he's reminded that he is a precious child of God, loved because of who he is, not what he's accomplished, he's just starting, not who he knows. And more importantly, he's never alone. God has his back. Plus, he's been baptized into a community of like-minded people who will help sustain him on this new phase of his journey. Because even when deep in our hearts we know that God loves us and cares us, sometimes we still need a God with skin on. To be able to see the light of God, experience the love of God through the touch, words, and actions of another human being. So in Jesus' story, this affirmation of being beloved by God turns out to be incredibly timely. Because immediately, immediately after his baptism is over, the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted and tested by Satan. Now with God's help, Jesus successfully clears that first hurdle. But honestly, things continue to be pretty rough. He's rejected by those he grew up with, treated with suspicion by those he's trying to help, harassed by the authorities, and frustratingly misunderstood by his own hand-picked disciples. Through all of these trials and tribulations, though, God's baptismal message helps us sustain and comfort Jesus and enable him to persist. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Now, when I think back to my baptism, I have to say that though it was far, far less dramatic, it did have a very lasting and sustaining impact on me. I was baptized as a teenager, actually at the same time that I was confirmed. So I felt a strong sense of belonging, particularly to the others in my confirmation class, several of whom are still good friends today. And I also felt really special because the whole church was celebrating me, or at least that's the way I felt. I think it's fair to say that I felt beloved, although I don't know that I would have used the word at that time. But it felt good. It felt empowering in a confidence-building sort of way. And I remember this because when you're a 13-year-old girl, there's not a lot of stuff that can make you feel that confidence. There's a lot more things that make you doubt yourself. So it, that feeling was pretty cool and it stuck with me. On this day, the day in which we celebrate the baptism of Jesus and the start of his ministry, we are each invited to remember our own baptisms and that feeling of being affirmed as a precious child of God, beloved for who you are, just as you are. Now I recognize this might be a challenge for some of us, um, perhaps you were baptized as a baby, 
or a really, 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 really long time ago, and you don't have a lot of memories of that experience that you can easily access. Or maybe you haven't been baptized yet at all, so you don't have an experience to remember. And, and that's okay, because God's love for us isn't dependent on anything that we do. We don't have to earn it. You are beloved just as you are. You are a valued member of a beloved community that is striving to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. And we've got your back. What do you think 2018 would be like if we all acted like we really believed that? Might believing that God sees me as precious, just as I am, make me doubt myself a little bit less? Maybe beat myself up a little bit less? Would it be easier to love my neighbor, even the one I've never seen before, if I believe that we both are God's children? Might I be less immediately dismissive of those that don't agree with me? Might I be even more willing to take a stand? We're at the start of a new year. And based on the first six days, this one promises to be no less dynamic than last year. Lots of opportunities for positive change, and probably some challenging tests and temptations that we'll need to navigate. May the love of God and the support of this beloved community sustain us on this phase of our journey.